Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We are so glad to have you all. Thank you to everyone who's able to join us this afternoon. I'm Lauren Hogan. I'm the Senior Director for Public Policy and Advocacy at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And whether you are still trying to figure out the letters of the, the order of the letters in the CCDBG acronym, or you are one of the folks calling your member of Congress every day about the increased funding, we're thrilled that you're here to talk, with, to talk about CCDBG with us today. We are here in part because a really good thing happened this year, and it happened because of many of you out there on the call and in the world. Because of your advocacy and the leadership of people in Congress, we received a historic increase in the Child Care and Development Block Grant. We're going to talk today about how that happened, about what opportunities it presents for kids and for families and for educators. We're going to talk about how you can be an advocate for the wise spending of the dollars. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do now and in the future to make sure that the funding continues. If you have any questions that you'd like to add along the way during the webinar today, please write them into the chat box at the bottom where you can see sort of off to the left-hand side, and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Now, to walk us through all these questions, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome my good friends and colleagues, Helen Blank and Hannah Matthews. Helen is the Director of Child Care and Early Learning at the National Women's Law Center, and Hannah is the Director of Child Care and Early Education at the Center for Law and Social Policy. We're all working closely together to ensure that all of you are carrying and echoing the same messages to your, to your legislatures and in your states and communities. Before we get to Helen, I just want to take a minute to make sure that everybody does know what CCDBG is and what it does, especially if you're one of the folks who are still working out the order of those letters. CCDBG helps low-income families access childcare by providing states with funding to address the affordability and improve quality. Essentially, it funds the childcare subsidy programs in your states. It was created in 1990, and when Helen tells us the story about how we got to the increase, she could go all the way back to 1990 to tell us that story. The, the program was last reauthorized in 2014 to help it better ensure the health and safety of children in childcare through more consistent standards and the monitoring of those standards. This was part of the reauthorization that many of you worked on. We all provided comments. Hannah and Helen and all of the advocates, state and federal, spent many, many, many hours, months, and years working towards a vision that came to fruition about how to help families more easily access childcare assistance. There's a lot, of, there's a lot around how to support stable and continuous childcare. There's a lot of effort to improve the quality of care, including increased set-aside, support for child care providers, and targeted initiatives. The increased quality set-aside is particularly important as we talk about the increase, because 8% of $2.37 billion on top of what you have is a lot more money. The problem at the time when we reauthorized the bill was that the reauthorization came without a guarantee of federal funding to support the implementation of the new requirements while states continued to support access for children and families. That is one of the things that we've been telling Congress for a long time that they started to respond to with this increase. A couple of things to know is before we head into how we got here. State plans under the reauthorization are created every three years. It used to be every two years. The state plans provide requirements for health and safety regulations, eligibility requirements for families, training professional development, licensing and monitoring, opportunities for quality. Basically, the entire gamut of your child care system in your state gives you a lot of opportunity to see where your state is headed around child care and how you can influence it. We'll talk a lot more about what that looks like in just a minute. The last thing to know about CCDBG is who is served. Right now, it serves about 1.4 million children, and approximately 373 fewer children received CCDBG funded care in 2015 than they did in 2006. We've been disinvesting in the system for a long time, and you'll see that in your states about what's been happening. 83% of children do not receive the support for which they are eligible, and this is due entirely to a lack of funding something that was integral in our sharing about how we got to where we are with this increase. So, now we're going to get to the good stuff. And yes, I do promise that you'll be singing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song in your head for the next several days. I certainly have been after I wrote this slide. Um, 
this is a story about how we got to a $2.37 billion increase. So, Helen, we're going to have you tell us a story. Before there was a double CCDVG hashtag, there was an idea. And before there was an idea, there was an elevated conversation about childcare. So take us back. Out of the start. Sure. And um, let me, um, we, we all as, this, as a coalition worked over actually sin, starting with the campaign in 2016 um, together. And, and that collective work helped to lead to this almost $2.4 billion increase in funding for child care. Um, President Trump was not for this when he was a candidate or later. This was not his goal. He actually was very upset when the omnibus budget bill passed. So it wasn't that we, um, we had the administration on our side. But what did happen that was unusual is that both Clinton and Trump talked about child care during the campaign. And the Trump campaign outlined a tax proposal late in 2016 that was primarily focused on higher income families. But that allowed us, members of the coalition, when we were talking to the media, because we got called to talk about the flaws in, that, in the Trump plan and also to talk about why you needed direct assistance, why you needed a program like CCDBG, to help lower and middle income families pay for childcare because they live paycheck to paycheck, and why we needed the money to improve the quality of childcare and support the workforce. So these efforts move the conversation away from a, a flawed tax plan, and it laid the groundwork for broader efforts to help low and middle income families and build the quality of care and increase compensation for providers. Right in January, at NWLC, rewrote something called Child Care was Fundamental. It was a basic primer on the state of child care that we shared with the coalition, key state advocates, and Hill staff. We all used it, all the coalition members, to go around the Hill, R's and D's, and, and talk about child care because there was this heightened awareness about it, but talk about what families and children and providers really needed. And then we launched together, we had several campaigns. NAEYC launched America's for Early Ed, Child Care Aware launched Child Care Works, and NWLC launched Child Care Now. And they weren't so dissimilar, and we connected with weekly calls. They were advocacy and communication campaigns to raise the public profile of child care and encourage diverse stakeholders to take action around the need for high-quality child care. The coalition focused on the need to increase funding for CCBG, even though we were talking to members about a tax bill. There were efforts to talk to members of Congress about things you could do in the tax system for child care. But we urged the coalition to have a primary message on CCDBG. Even though it was not likely you would have CCDBG increases added to a tax bill, but it wasn't impossible. And we focused on generating an urgency around child care, getting a broader network of supporters, and cultivating federal child care ch champions. We had a strong focus on social media. There were a lot of infographics. There were a lot of Twitter campaigns. We had regular communications with all our coalitions, and we all worked with all of you all to you know, get messages out to state advocates. We met with Hill staff. Um, NAYC, when it was, it, you had, you actually had two bites of the apple because during this period you had two public policy conferences. We did research on state child care systems policies. Um, the center does an annual report on these policies, but we did a special report on infant and toddler rates, and we sent that to the Hill in the middle of the debate around the budget agreement and getting more funding with child care. So we kept sending things to the Hill that describe the gaps in our current system. We had an unusual opportunity. When you look at all of these efforts, there, there are many things that came together. One was a bipartisan um, report that had George Miller, a very liberal member um, of Congress from California who had been, who was retired, and Senator Santorum, a very conservative member from Pennsylvania, agreed on numerous um, child care changes in the report. And one, the first one was a 
doubling of CCDBG money, even bigger than what we eventually um, got. Um, and that was because um, during one of their briefings, one of our own advocates talked about tax credits and said, but you really needed to have CCDBG. And a longtime Hill staff person who is also not on the Hill anymore, but um, a good advocate for child care talked about why you needed CCDBG. So we had a bipartisan policy center report that talked about CCBG. And then, for those of you who are looking at the slides on the webinar, that picture is up. It was part of advocacy in many different forms. Helen talked about the visits that we made, the letters that we sent, the coalition partnership, and the many sign-ons that were part of all of the different pieces of making this work. And I think that that is part of the lesson that we're hoping advocates take away from this effort is the work all through talking about child care and all of the different times that you can. So when the moment hits that you can take advantage of it, like Helen says, that was the time that we were able to say, great, we have an idea for how, ex how exactly how much money we're talking about here. Yeah, you have to lay the groundwork. This didn't come out of nowhere. But then when Senator Elizabeth Warren spoke at the center's dinner about her own child care experience in October of 2017, people were going, wow, Senator Warren's never talked about child care. And we produced a short midi a video of her remarks and posted it on our Facebook page and website because she was very dramatic. It wasn't all about policy. It was her own needs and how her Aunt B saved her. And then her staff contacted CLAFT and the center and said, oh, we want a major increase in the budget bill. Um, and Senator um, Schumer's and Sanders have made this their top priorities, you know, three extremely liberal members of Congress, and they wanted all these calculations as to how many children you get with so much money. And, you know, there was a big budget agreement in January. We had a raise. This was discretionary child care money, and we had a problem because there was too little money for all the uses, for roads, for NIH, for transportation, for foreign affairs, and the, the, there was con, the um, conservatives wanted that money raised just for the, what we call caps raised just for defense. If we didn't raise these caps, we would have seen big cuts. And the Democrats said, no, you've got to raise them for non-defense programs too. And these three senators said, and we want some specific priorities when you do this because we want to show that we can make a difference. And doubling CCDBG funding was one of their priorities. So there we got it, but then we told you all that wasn't enough because then they did a specific appropriations bill. And that's when you were on the Hill um, in early March and you didn't only go with talking about Senator Murray and Bobby Scott's new child care bill, you talked about the importance of making this CCDBG increase happen. And it happened, we didn't get 2.9, but we got 2.4, which is the biggest increase in history. And the other important thing as you go through this is that we had a big celebration on the Hill with the coalition, with NAYC, with Moms Rising, with CLASS, with Zero Three, with Child Care Aware. And we had it um, up in the committee room that deals with child care and Senator Murray, Senator Warren, um, and Representative Rosa Dolores spoke. And we all, and I'm sure you've seen the pictures, got invited to um, Senator Schumer, the minority leader's office, who talked about caregiver wages when we went to see him. So we thought it was important to keep the members focused on this issue, and they were very proud of this increase. So we, you know, we, we, we've come a long way, and it really happened because all you started to do um, in 2016. So thanking one of the advocates, thanking the people who sort of led this effort was one of the things that I think we take away from this effort is how important it is for them to understand what a big deal this is. And we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the webinar about what you all can be doing to make sure that we're able to keep the money moving forward. Are there any other sort of key lessons to take away? What were some of the worrisome moments in this process? There was a budget deal, then we had to make that budget deal real. We had to keep fighting and we'll continue to do so as we move forward. We'll talk about that in a minute. But are there any other lessons that you really want to highlight for the educators and advocates on the call today about what the lessons to take away from this experience has been? Helen or Hannah. I think one of the lessons, this is Hannah, is that your stories really work. So as much as the doubling CCWG was a short-term campaign, as Helen said, there were long-term efforts before that. But 
really at the core of this increase was Congress's interest in actually providing resources to implement the 2014 child care reauthorization. And the reason they wanted to do that is that we have spent years giving them the stories that you all have about how much this is going to cost, that moving to 12-month eligibility is good for families, but it costs money, that making the health and safety and the quality expansions are important, but they cost money. And so we've been able to tell the story of the number of kids that have lost assistance, and we've been able to tell the story about how important the changes in the law are to really moving childcare forward. And so those were no small those contributed to this effort because Congress really wanted to see the reauthorization get implemented. Yeah, that's really important that they hadn't provided the money for the reauthorization. And I think the other important thing is we asked for something big. And people said, are you crazy? Are you crazy asking for CCBG in a tax fight? What's the matter with you? So I think the other big lesson is you don't get what you don't ask for. I and also wanted to, to add to get smaller. <laughs> I also wanted to add to that. I do, you know, sometimes we hear from advocates who come to public policy forum for the first time and aren't sure what to say. Hannah's point about telling your story and feeling comfortable in that is so important because it does, telling your story is what you can always do. You can't go wrong with that and making sure that you're able to say, this is what it looks like to me on the ground, how much that matters to hear, how much it means to them to hear. And being there in March this year, as all of this was happening, was fortuitous timing um, and just a wonderful experience to be with so many of you, with 300 of you up on the hill um, making this case and being able to celebrate then um, when, the, when the money came through. So now we have the money. And the question now is what's it for? What are we gonna do with it? How do we move forward? I wanna talk just briefly about what Congress says the money is for. And up on the screen, you'll see a direct, these are the report language from Congress. That means it's the language that Congress uses to tell the states what the money should be for. It is to support the full implementation of the CCDBG Act as reauthorized in 2014, including activities to improve the quality and safety of childcare programs, increasing provider reimbursement rates, and ensuring health and safety standards are met. I want to talk just briefly about the spending priorities from our perspective and from the perspective of the advocates in the field about what we need. We just talked, I was just on a call with Helen, that Helen and Hannah led with a number of the state advocates talking about what they were fighting for in their own states and what their states were prioritizing. We really feel that in addition to expanding access and implementing policies that support continuity and consistency for families, States need to take this opportunity to prioritize quality by investing in the early childhood education workforce. And one of the best ways to do that is to raise payment rates. We heard from a number of states that are working on this already. Maryland passed a bill. Maine overrode a governor's veto last night, just last night, on making sure that they're raising their reimbursement rates from 50 to 75%, um, making them, I think, the third state now to have reimbursement rates at 75% and to not supplant TANF funding. This is incredibly important. Hannah, can you talk just a minute about what that means to not supplant TANF funding? Sure, so um, as Lauren said, this is important because to get this kind of an increase, it has to actually be an increase. <laughs> Congress wants to see that there is a new investment in childcare and that we can actually grow the program. So the appropriation law includes language that prohibits states from supplanting their child care, their regular child care spending from their state budget. So in other words, states cannot say, great, we have new federal dollars, now we are not going to put our own money in. They can't supplant their own dollars. The problem is that supplantation language does not apply to TANF-funded child care. So states choose whether they use TANF dollars for child care, either spending directly or transferring TANF dollars to CCDBG. And so this is something to watch because there's not a big authority in terms of holding states um, to the dollars if they're already spending TANF dollars on child care, but you certainly can make a fuss and make it look bad that the state would essentially not be 
um, allowing these new dollars to really have the, the effect that they could in terms of expanding access and, and making other improvements to the program. So it's an important thing for state advocates to watch closely as you move through your budget um, cycles and really be kind of keeping an eye on those dollars and, again, making a fuss if you need to. I think that's an incredibly important point because, like, the Calvary's not coming on this one, guys. Like, there isn't, a, there's nobody else who's going to say, you can't do that. You guys and the state advocates out in the field are the ones who have to say, hey, we're watching you, and we have our eye on this. They need to know that somebody is, somebody's are paying attention to make sure that this money goes to the kids and families and the educators in the way that it is supposed to. There are lots of opportunities specifically to invest in the workforce. There are opportunities to tier reimbursement rates to financially reward highest quality programs while also providing additional support to lower quality programs so they can improve, funding the I, essentially, and QRIS. Um, there's using quality set-aside money, the quality set-aside funds that can go to training and professional development, that can go to wage supplements and tax credits to keep educators in the field once they've received additional training and education. There's a lot that you can do to direct funding towards the workforce since we know that's really where the quality hits in terms of making a difference for kids and families. You can fund linguistically and culturally appropriate outreach. This is a huge part of what's in the CCDBG law and regulations. This is an opportunity to make sure that that is not sidelined, but that work to ensure that there's a diverse and equitable profession is part of the CCDBG implementation and that there's money prioritized to spend in that direction. A couple more things to know and we want to have just a little conversation about this. The money that is in FY18 are baseline dollars that were provided in the context of regular appropriations. Some people want to know things like, is the money permanent? There's no such thing as permanent when it comes to annual appropriations, but these are not intended to be one-time only dollars. We will have to fight for funding in FY19, 20, and beyond like we always do, but we want to spend the money well and wisely so that we have the right thing to fight for. Hannah, do you have anything to add on, you've spoken with a lot of the state administrators, both of you, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're hearing from them and what they need to be hearing from the field? The administrators need to be hearing that they should spend the money. <laughs> so uh, to be honest, it was a little slow going in terms of the states hearing directly from the federal government um, that the money is coming and what their specific allocations will be um, and how this process is going to work. That word has gone out to the states now, so they should not be kind of in a waiting mode where they, they have been for some time. But it's important to kind of balance two different objectives here. Um, the states are getting a large, large increase in money three quarters of the way through the fiscal year. So while they have some time to spend the money, they have a couple of years to obligate the dollars and a third year to spend them, it's also a very unusual circumstance to have quite that much money to get out the door um, under the current timeline. So they really mm -hmm. need to be put to make sure that they're not leaving any funds unspent. At the same time, we obviously want them to use the funds in a thoughtful way. And what that looks like is going to be different in different states. And I'm sure you all have um, – your coalitions and, and tables that can come together to talk about where your state is, what the needs are, and, and how to really address some of these priority areas that Lauren talked about and others. So we have to balance this kind of urgency of making sure the dollars are spent while also really spending them wisely and thinking about what, in fact, we're using them for and what we're working towards. I think one of the pieces that we've been talking about with this $2 billion is that um, it is this dramatic increase in funding, historic increase in funding, and yet given the need for childcare across the country, it's a pretty small amount of money compared to what, mm -hmm. what we know is needed for kids and families. So I think balancing kind of what your vision is and where the dollars should go and what you want to be building towards and making sure that you're moving there somewhat quickly um, is really important. And I think that's where you can really push the state to make sure they're spending the dollars there in that direction. Yeah, it, it's, it's also important to know that you have two years to obligate or make the decision. It's two years from October 1st, 2017. But you're not- And can you clarify what, 
Can you clarify you obligate? Two years. For obligate is really to to decide where the money is going, to to let a contract, to make you know, to Legally put connect. your plan in place. It's a legal term, but you have two years to make those decisions. And then you have several years after that to spend the money. So if you don't have, you know, we were, we, it was interesting on the call because several legislat legislatures have raised rates. I think it was three of them. So that's mm -hmm. pretty quick. Um, but that doesn't mean you couldn't raise rates in a year with this money. So as Hannah said, you know, go quickly, but be thoughtful. I mean, we, you know, you don't want the, you don't want them to stall. You don't want them to say you, this is one time only money, which it isn't. But there is time to have some input. And what you don't want them to do is you don't want your legislature to spend money, to use this money up for something like all new computers, right, quickly when nobody's watching. You really don't. <laughs> you really don't want your states to spend this money on all new computers. We want it to spend on the things that we know will matter, back to the things that Congress intended the money to be spent on and the things that we told them we needed the money for. So while we're talking about this mix of years, you have two years to obligate and a certain amount of years to spend. Welcome to the fun of fiscal years dealing with state and federal government. Let's move into FY19, um, which is happening, plans are happening now. So Helen, tell us a little bit more about fiscal year 19 and where we stand with the money. Just for the knowledge back to the budget deal, the budget deal was a two-year budget deal. That means it covered FY18, which we're in, and FY19, which is next. The appropriations only dealt with FY18, because appropriations only goes year by year. So while the deal said, yep, there's the same amount of money coming next year, we're still gonna have to say, this is the time to fight for that deal. So tell us a little bit more about sort of what we've been doing together and where the advocates can engage to sort of help move this forward. Yes, yeah. so you've had a lot of practice because we told you <laughs> there was a budget deal and some of you said, oh my goodness, it's done. But as you, you know, you went on all those visits in March, you knew it wasn't done because Congress had to do an appropriations bill. So, and it was a two year deal, but they still have to do an appropriations bill in FY19. And nothing holds them to those decisions, but the the budget agreement and the senators that pushed it said, this is two years, this is 5.8 over two years. So just like the, the coalition sent a letter that said, we want this funding, we want you to honor the whole budget deal, so we'd want the total over two years to be 5.8. We sort of, we aimed big. But, you know, regardless now, your members, have, we, you need to thank your members for this historic increase and tell them how important it is to maintain the budget agreement for FY19 and what your state is thinking of doing and how important it is to continue these funding, whether it's raising rates or more children, that this is a critical support, they, you want to implement the new reauthorization, what's your state doing? to do that, and many of those costs are not one time only. So you just have to be in front of your members. It may seem it is, it's pretty exhausting, right? Because we just finished this up on March 23rd. Now we're talking to you about how you should get your states to implement this and how you ought to be in front of your legislators and administrators. And we're also saying you gotta go back to your members of Congress that you saw in March and say, wait, now we want you to make sure that this is there, this increase is there for FY19. So it's the same thing. It's emailing, it's calling, it's writing, it's going to see them when they're home, it's telling them the stories of how you think this money is going to make a difference. It's just being present because a lot of other groups with, you know, a lot of other needs are also present. I mean, this could drag on like many things, it could drag on beyond the election, but we know the House is likely the committee responsible for child care to mark up a bill in June. So they have to hear from you. And if you, you know, Lauren can help. If you have a member on the appropriations committee, you have to work doubly hard. But they have to know you're grateful for the money. That's always the first step. And they have to know we need it next year. Yes. The fun, ne the fun never ends, guys. I think no. the... <laughs> The, this is all one sort of coherent message, though, that you're hearing from, from all of us and from the other state advocates in the group. Tell them about what, you, what your work is. Tell them about what you're doing. 
tell them about how much it matters and talk about why what they did was appreciated and why it needs to continue. It's sort of one, it's not like different messages that were, that you're needing to convey. It's all part and parcel of the same story about the kind of investment that we need in high quality early childhood education. Helen talks about the importance of sort of showing up and being in front of folks. I want you to honestly put your hand up wherever you are. If you're, well, I hope you're not in the car. I feel like people are always listening to webinars in the car. I worry about that. So hopefully you're not in the car. But if wherever you are, put your hand up if you've heard the line about how 80% of the battle is just showing up. I'm going to assume there are hands up all over the country right now. This, you got to show up. I was just hearing from an advocate who there was a child, the planning meeting for the for the CCCF plan was happening and she said she was the only childcare person there. And they had combined it with a meeting on rehabilitation um, and disability. And they had their community showed up folks, everybody, they had dozens of people there to talk about the same planning process. And we need to talk about how important it is for us to show up and make our voices heard in this process. So we're going to talk for a minute about what it means, what a CCDS plan is, what we can, how we can engage in that, um, and what to prioritize. Hannah, can you start us off by just telling us a little bit about the implementation guide and sort of how we think about what states should be doing as they think about the, these next three years and beyond? Sure. So, um, first. Let me start with kind of what it, what is the state plan and how does that relate? So the state plan is the state's kind of formal application for the dollars, and that's um, what they have to send to the federal government that outlines how they're going to spend their CCDBG money, not just the increase, but their, their whole block grant. And so as Lauren said at the beginning of the call, it lays out what their eligibility policies are, all of their different policies for the dollars. The state plan that states are writing right now will be the first state plan that needs to reflect both the reauthorization as well as the regulations that followed. So if you remember back to the 2014 reauthorization, there was states were writing their state plans three years ago, but the final rule had not been released yet on the child care law. So this is the first time that states will have to be reporting what policies they have that actually are in line with the rule. Now keep in mind that the process of writing the state plan is um, one that happens inside government and then there is a public comment period, but it's a process that's already been in place and was moving forward before the dollars. So when your draft state plan comes out, I would not anticipate necessarily seeing anything that is an indication of where they would actually put the new dollars. That doesn't mean that it's not an opportunity to start telling the states where they should be doing with the dollars. So as Lauren said, when you show up, when you actually go to these hearings, when you submit comments, you can be telling your state what the priorities should be. They may not be reflected ultimately in that plan that they submit, but please don't be worried about that. Those plans are due July 1st. It's not a lot of time. And just as we said, we don't want states necessarily to rush into this process. So there is a process for states to actually make amendments to their plans um, throughout the three years. And that's what many state administrators have told us that they're preparing to do. Their state plans will not reflect the expansion, but they'll make amendments. So the state showing up for the state plans is important, but think of it as kind of your first step. And we're gonna continue to engage with states over several years. One place that you can look for ideas of where states should be thinking about is this reauthorization guide that CLASS and the National Women's Law Center wrote jointly. We actually wrote an original guide after the law passed in 2015, and then we released an updated one in 2017 that reflects the rule. And the reauthorization guide includes all of the components that were in the reauthorization. So it talks through what eligibility policies, what continuity policies are good for kids, what continuity policies are important for providers, how should you think about payment rates, what are some possible uses of quality dollars. It has all of those considerations and some state examples as well. So that's a resource that you can certainly feel free to draw on as you think about how your program should grow in your state. I really want to emphasize Hannah's point about 
sometimes I think when we comment on things and then we don't see those changes reflected, we think our comments weren't heard or that our voice doesn't matter. And I think it's really important to note that your comments won't necessarily re be reflected in the draft that is submitted to the Administration for Children and Families on July 1st, but that that does not mean that your voice wasn't heard or that they won't come back to you or that you don't need to continue saying, this is what our state needs, this is what we wanna see in our plan because there will be so many opportunities for amending, for updating, and for providing additional opportunities to comment on here's what we really need and here's how it should look. Um, we put in a couple on the slide ways to check your child care state administrator's webpage to read the draft plan, to learn about due dates for comments, to put the public meetings in your calendar. We know and I've had the opportunity to see some of your state comments as well as some of your plans. Um, and please feel free to send those to me if you have questions or want assistance with language. We're happy to be here for you for that. Um, and if some of your due dates are passed, don't worry about it because there are, again, so many more opportunities to continue engaging. I do want to point out how important it is for you guys to be working with your other state advocates and in partnership to make sure that you're reinforcing each other's messages and priorities. We don't want your administrator to be hearing from different segments of the field that say, do this, no, do this, no, do this, no, do this. We really want them to hear from all of us working together about what these priorities are and what we want folks to do. I know many of you have been doing an extraordinary job of that already in your state, and we're very grateful for all of your work on that front. If you don't know where to start, you're interested but don't know where to begin, please feel free to reach out to your AUIC affiliate, to me to connect you to the AUIC affiliate, or to others, your R&R, your early childhood state advocate um, group in your state. Most of us will be able to plug folks into the process and we really need more voices who can be present at the hearings all over the state and who can put in comments and sign on, do all of the important work. As you're sort of writing those comments, it's very hard to say, here are the things that you should say. The states are so different and your plans are so different, but you do wanna make sure that you are identifying and lifting up the strengths of the plan to say, here are the good things that are happening that we can build on, and to identify the opportunities for improvement, being specific in your written comments in particular about the sections of the plan that need to be changed. One opportunity, particularly from the early childhood professional development systems perspective and thinking about how you want to frame out your comments. The regulations identified those six components of a professional development framework that are aligned with NAYC's, the professional standards, pathways, articulation, um, compensation parity, advisory structure, data and financing. You really want to think about those, um, those components of that framework and the sort of essential questions that you can ask about, is this moving it forward? It's a good way to think about how to connect the work that you guys are doing with what you want to see move forward for child care and early childhood education in your state. We talked a little bit about what states can be doing, and I just want to close out by talking a little bit about the importance, I think we've touched upon this throughout, but the importance of your advocacy and why it matters so much. If you have any questions as we're walking through the end of the advocacy part, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, you can also feel free to email advocacy at naeyc.org at any time with questions, and we'll get back to you. I want you to know that your policymakers really need your expertise. You don't be surprised. They don't know everything, as it turns out. It's really important that they hear from you and that they know that what you say actually does matter. It makes an enormous difference. On what you can do, we started with thanking your member of Congress. We want to end with thanking your member of Congress and letting them know how much the increased funding matters. To ask them to ensure that the FY19 appropriations bill includes the full $5.8 billion over two years for CCDBG. Basically, the budget deal was a pinky swear, um, and we're trying to make sure that we hold, like, we're treating it like it was signed in blood, basically. Like, you all made a budget deal. You have to keep to it. Um, and here's what that means for kids and families. We want you to participate in your written and in-person CCDF state plan outreach and comment processes. 
You can testify at budget hearings. I know there are folks on the call who have done that for the first time this year, um, and it really is such a great opportunity to say, here is what we need in our state um, for kids and families. You can invite your legislators to see high quality early childhood education in action. Come to your center, come to your family child care home. Look at what we're doing with the subsidy dollars, with your investment. Look at what happens for kids and families here. Um, and you can tell your child care an early learning story. Finally, you can vote. You can vote for the candidates to make sure that they are talking on both sides of the aisle about the importance of early childhood education and investing in early childhood educators. If you are not already receiving information from America for Early Ed, which Helen talked about at the beginning of the call, we hope that you will sign up so that you can access the resources, the weekly emails that we send, all of the information that helps you stay connected. This, this is back in the November, October, December screenshot of all the emails that we were sending weekly about the importance of engaging in double CCDBG and making those calls and being able to celebrate, then in being able to talk about how we needed you to keep fighting so that we could really celebrate once the money happened. It's a great way to stay involved and connected, to stay connected to the Child Care Now campaign and also for Child Care Works and to make sure that you're really engaging and that the national organizations work together at your state level as well. I wanna close out just by making sure that you all are directed to some additional resources. Um, they're from Helen, Hannah at Class and, and, and National Women's Law Center, as well as some of our other partners. Many folks are talking about the importance of child care development block grant and what we can do with this money um, and how much we can take the opportunity to really advance our vision and our priorities for high quality early childhood education in this country. Helen and Hannah, anything to add? Last words of advice and wisdom. I just didn't get to it. There are a couple questions, and I think it'll be helpful to answer some of the questions because they, you know, reflect the need to get to it. But All I, right, know, I let's think get to it. I would just say congratulations. You've done a really great job on elevating child care, and now we just have to keep pushing it forward. We, 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 okay. we I, sort of bro broken through. <laughs> okay. I think the difference between – the CCDBG and CCDF, great question. We're essentially talking about the same thing. The, the law <laughs> in Congress is called CCDBG. Um, lots of times when the dollars go out from the um, Administration for Children and Families, they refer to all of the different funding streams that comprise the child care dollars as the child care development fund. For the purposes of what we're talking about now, it's, it's all the same. Welcome to Congress, where we like naming the same thing, different acronyms. But Congress doesn't know what CCDF is, so that's why all your advocacy is around CCDBG. It's not in legislation. They don't pass a CCDF law. So, so there's a question say, about... Oh, use it with them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's a question you about... Your CC... You will see a CCDF state plan, and your administrator will say CCDF. Yeah. But when you're doing your right. hill visits, you want to say CC to BG. Isn't this fun? Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question about funding being distributed equally or distributed according to child care programs that have higher ratings. So there's a funding formula. Yeah. There's a funding formula that allocates the federal funds to states, and then states have a process for. Um, spent making their investments in quality and then providing families with child care assistance, which they can use for various programs. So in terms of where the dollars go at the state level, that's going to look different in every state. But a number of states don't have well-developed QRIS systems, and there's some challenges now because a lot of programs in low-income communities with low rates and, and a drop in kids really have been starved. So it, 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 there's some issues in terms of where your state is as to whether you ought to be tying your money to higher ratings. Um, but that's, just, that's another topic. There are a number of folks who asked for links, and um, all of those are embedded in the slides. And we will also make sure that those are available to folks. We'll respond to folks in the webinar so that folks get those answers. Um, 
Last question is about family, friend, and neighbor programs and providers. So how can funds make their way to family, friend, and neighbor programs and providers? Well, that's, that's sort of related to the other question. Your, yeah. you know, your state can decide you know, how to support some providers, and some states choose not to support FFN providers. You know, for low-wage moms, this is an important source of care. So it depends on what your state decides to do in terms of its so where it's directing money to types of care. Um, and family and family providers, FFN providers differ in every state. In some 10 states, it's just relative because of how you define licensure regulated care. And then very little state money is used to actually support organizations that support these providers so that the potential use of new quality dollars. There's provisions in the reauthorization about monitoring these providers, which will also take new money. So if, if your state, in, you know, in order to meet the new law, if it has a number of FFN providers getting CCBG, it'll have to pay attention to those provisions. Um, I noticed a, a question about 2017 or 2018. You have from October, two years start October 1, 2017 because that's when the fiscal year started. And what is the maximum percentile that a state can pay? I think that's a question about reimbursement rates. When we talk about the 75th percentile of market rate, that gets into how states assess what you're paying providers. And we use the 75th percentile of market rate as the Sort of bench the current federal benchmark for what the payment rate to providers should be. Um, what's the highest it's ever gone, Helen? Well, right now there's only two states that pay at the 75th percentile. We just heard there was a third from it because of legislation. Maine. <laughs> Maine. But, so now there's three that pay at the at, at, at a current market rate survey. It's all and many states are way way beyond. Yes. There's nothing that you couldn't pay higher for, you know, certain types of care, care and, you know, yep. it's hard to find rural areas. So you have more flexibility, but all these years it's really been anywhere from one to two to three states that really paid at the current market rate. And as a result, you have a really, you know, you have, we, we sort of weakened the infrastructure of child care in low-income communities, and that's why we're hearing a lot of states talk about the importance of raising rates. When you talk about all the children losing child care, and Lauren talked about that at the beginning, the fewer kids getting assistance, and you talk about the rates, it's hard to have, you know, customers um, in, in low-income communities. So and it is a very important issue. I would not worry that your state can't raise rates. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's nothing, nobody's too high. We don't, that's not a problem we have yet. Here's hoping right. that we get to that problem. All right, and on that note, thank you to everybody for joining us on the call today. Please don't hesitate to email us at any time if you have questions at advocacy at NAYC.org. Um, thank you so much to Helen and to Hannah for taking time out of their day to join us, um, and to all of you for taking time out of your day for joining us as well. Good luck out there, and everybody go fight for kids and families and educators. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you.